As the global pandemic swept across our nation, our lives were uprooted and forever changed. What has been accomplished over the past four months from our education community and our families is nothing short of mirac miraculous. We recognize the concerns across our state about K-12 schools, and as we have seen in this pandemic, as in every disaster in North Dakota, our approach to working as one has allowed us to continue serving our communities. Just as we have managed to respond quickly this past spring, we know there may be challenges yet ahead. We know there will be challenges ahead. But as we all do every day, as parents, teachers, community leaders, we need to lead by example and show our students how to face adversity with a growth mindset. So to talk more about the K-12 Smart Restart, we are excited to welcome Luke Schaefer, Executive Director of CREA, which is the Central Region Education Association and Chair of the North Dakota K-12 Coordination Council that, the, that Governor Burgum spoke about earlier, who will moderate our conversation with questions from the audience. Welcome, Luke. <laughs> Thank you, Governor Burgum and Superintendent Baszler, first off, for having me on stage with you. It's always an honor to be on stage with you, but certainly for putting on a great day for all of the thousand people who are here. Uh, and, you know, we've got 30 minutes to talk about K-12 restart, and it, it may seem like a very difficult thing. It may be a very simple thing, but a lot of people would like to know more about this. So it's been exactly one week since we had the announcement that uh, we would be opening schools up with some local authority. Uh, it's the K-12 Smart Restart Health and Safety Guidance was released a week ago. Can you just share a little bit about the process that went into building that and announcing it? Certainly, I, I can start. Um, so I, we started thinking about reopening schools moments after we decided, the governor decided that it would be best for our state to close schools until we learned more about COVID-19, until we learned more about what our state's systems could provide. And so as we started thinking about reopening, it was important for us to engage with our stakeholders because as we all know, the best decisions are made with many mind, minds working on the problem. And so we began holding listening sessions and having conversations. And, and fortunately, I feel blessed at least to be able to have had several mechanisms already in place and in existent in form. We have our, the state superintendent's student cabinet. We have the family cabinet of the state superintendents. We have our advisory cabinets of elementary principals, secondary principals and local district superintendents. We have the great associations of our school boards association, our council for educational leaders, and of course our, our teachers with ND United. And so having all of those mechanisms and those relationships in place, what formally um, were what was formally meetings and conversations that occurred once every quarter with those cabinets were now occurring weekly for an hour, hour and a half. Um, telephone conversations, daily updates, weekly briefings, and Q&As. And so we collected all that information and, and, uh, in, in preparation for, for the conversation today. The department tallied up how many hours that was, and there was over 250 hours that were logged in formal meetings and formal conversations, uh, soliciting feedback, asking questions, providing opportunity for them to provide insight and perspective. We met with our tribal councils uh, on, a, on a, a very consistent basis. The governor was able to organize those and invited us in. And so as we began to think about that, uh, we began thinking about reopening. And something that I think is unique to North Dakota and important for us to remember and, and take pride in is that while others closed their schools, they also closed their learning. We never did that in North Dakota. Education continued to occur. Teaching and learning continued to occur on a, on a daily basis. And so as we began thinking about reopening, we had the conversation about what do we do about summer school? And so while other states were sitting back trying to draft plans for the fall, we were continuing the teaching and learning in North Dakota and having conversations about how we might do a soft reopening this summer. So in May, we provided some guidance for summer school. And as the governor you know, so, so articulately 
um, explained that it was going to be a soft reopening and we were going to have a, a data set, if you will, on what was going well and could we do a soft reopening while still keeping our communities safe. And so we instituted those summer school guidelines. The governor amended his executive order. And as soon as that occurred, we began collecting that data and having conversations with our school districts, our parents, our students, their families, and our teachers. And we began planning for what our fall guidance would look like. The end of June, we worked with our leaders, both again in the, the School Boards Association, ND United, and NDCEL. And that group of people put together a first draft that they presented to the governor's office, to our partner at the Department of Health, Dr. Stahl, and DPI team, of course, some suggestions on what they would like included in the guidance. And at that point, um, we began meeting frequently with the governor's office, the Department of Health, and it resulted in, I think, a very good document. And I'll let the governor expand. Yeah, thanks, Luke. And I, and I would say, uh, <coughs> as you hear, extensive process on the decision on reopening and why not just because schools are important, but when this is the biggest single location of transmissible moments in the state. I mean, 120,000 kids, five days a week, eight hours a day, plus 15,000 staff, administrators, and faculty, that dwarfs anything that we could talk about in terms of bars or you know, other places where, you know, churches where transmission may occur. I mean, the biggest population, then you throw higher education on top of it. And we know, we're learning, no, we know more about the virus now than we did, but we know that it, 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 it moves more uh, easily indoors than outdoors. Uh, it moves when people are talking and when, when people are singing in choirs and shouting and things like that more than it does when they're not. Uh, may explain why there's maybe less transmission on planes because people aren't often talking as much and they're wearing masks on planes. But it, it's a, we continue to learn more and more about it. We also, you know, understand more clearly now that this is a deadly disease if you're older and have underlying health conditions. Uh, but we don't know fully everything that we need to know about uh, the impacts on, on, younger, on younger children, on students. Uh, and, and we also know that you can be asymptomatic. We know that you can have no symptoms and spread it. So all these things make for a very complex set of decision making. Uh, and, and all along, we've been trying to do two things. We want to save lives and livelihoods. Uh, and I think, again, people maybe thought we took it lightly or we were... Uh, you know, looking at, at, at being overreactive when we first closed the schools. But at the time we closed ours, this thing was already starting to rage in New York. New York didn't close their schools till about three weeks after their first case. And it's one of the reasons why things took off in the New York metro areas, because they were so slow to eliminate all these transmissible moments. And here uh, and in other states, it was less about the stay at home because, you know, you, you can, it's about how close you are to other people in close contact uh, you know, in buildings. So it we wouldn't, we didn't make sense to issue a stay at home or a shelter in place order for the state of North Dakota when most of the places in our state are so remote that you can go, you can, you, know, you can spend days not being within six feet of somebody. Uh, but if you've got, but if you're in a school, that's really hard to do, and especially for younger, younger students. So I, I think again, in retrospect, it was one of the decisions that helped us not really participate in the spring surge. We don't know what's ahead of us here, but we're, we're heading into the fall, uh, as the superintendent said, very thoughtfully, very collaboratively, getting input. Uh, K-12 Coordinating Council, thanks, Luke, for being the leader of that organization. But as I've talked to other governors, we're so fortunate that we actually have a place where we can get together with all the associations and all the different groups and with the legislator to end with the uh, executive branch and with teachers, get everybody together in a room and talk about what's the best and safest way to do it. Because we know that there's the physical danger of the virus, but we also know that what happened this spring is with behavioral health and with people that were falling behind in school and with the social and emotional needs that students have and the challenges it meant for working parents and for families. I mean, there's a uh, there's there's risks associated with not having kids in school, you know, increased amounts of abuse. I mean, all of those things were are, we have to take in consideration as we move forward. So we're we were looking at this thing. I, I, I've got to say there was a hundred variables that are going into the decision, but I feel good about where we are, and we've got uh, again local control here. Uh, the I've described it as you know shutting off a light switch in the spring, not something we did lightly. But as we open up in the fall, uh, building. Building leaders uh, the, and school boards are going to be, they're going to be in the arena. 
they're not, it's not going to be on the sidelines. They're going to be in the arena having to deal with all the tough decisions about, you know, what happens when we get a COVID case in an elementary school? What happens when we got a vulnerable teacher? I mean, we'll be right there to support and help in the Department of Health. But I, it's not just, I, it, we have 400 plus buildings in the state, 175 districts. <clears throat> you multiply these, there's going to be thousands of difficult decisions that lie ahead of us. And we're going to need leadership like we've never leaded before from school boards and building leaders. Leadership at all levels. Uh, you oftentimes say that, Governor Burgum, and on social media, um, we might, oftentimes we see you called the governor of data. You really seem to love data. There are teachers, parents, there are administrators, legislators. Uh, we have school board members in attendance today. Uh, you may not be able to describe what school is going to look like, but what can we expect from the state? What should the state expect here in North Dakota that next school year could look like? Well, I, I would say, again, that's part of what today's conference is about, which is, you know, how do we take a crisis and then and respond better than any other state? And I think the other thing is the reason why we have to do this is for the students. I mean... Students in other states are going to be looking at adults bickering at each other and not focusing on their education. And I, you know, this could be, could be walkouts, could be this, could be that, could be whatever. But we're going to see a battle, battle royale in other states around education in the fall. If North Dakota can stay focused on what's right for our, for the students, uh, what's in that we, and, and it was said this morning uh, that we're all learners, that we as adults have to learn. We're all going into an environment that we've not been into before. Uh, I'll take that as applause. That was a, uh, but a, but, we're, but we, if we're going into an environment that's unknown, if we're going into uncharted territory, then this is a chance for us as adults to, to model what learning looks like, to model what perseverance looks like, to model what curiosity looks like, to model humility. You have to be humble in the face of a situation where we literally don't have the answers and everybody wants us to give them the answer. But we don't have the answer because we've, we've not had a pandemic in our lifetimes and we haven't had now and we haven't had a we've had a pandemic in North Dakota for four months we have a little experience we don't have a pandemic with a hundred and sixty thousand K through university kids interacting with each other every day I mean so we're so the fall is going to represent some real learning for us and that's a you know again will present itself with challenges so I think the governor captured it very well um, the I think what the what I think is most important that I have garnered from conversations that I've had with people as I grocery shop or if I you know as I'm leaving church the questions that they want to know will it be like last spring will the fall be another repeat of that and so you know I, I interpret that in a couple of different ways first they're asking me will our children be able to go back to school and will they be able to stay in school and so as the governor had mentioned earlier the American uh, Academy of, a Pedi of Pediatrics has said it's best for every school to begin planning with the idea that they will be back in school. Because we, we know, the American Academy of Pediatrics knows that that's what's best for, for young people. And so our schools are planning with the idea in mind that they will be in-person teaching and learning, possibly some hybrid, possibly some, some modification of that. But there will be that. But I also believe we should all enter into this fall and winter, this 2021 school year, realizing that it will be very likely that there will be some disruption of learning, that there will be a confirmed case in a school building or a school district. And that is why when we, do, when we plan for the health and safety plan, school boards approve those plans and the distance learning plans, that they're very intentional about making sure that whatever they're putting on paper, whatever they're putting in the plan, is something that they will be able to implement. Not having a disruption during the 2021 school year will be the anomaly. That will be the exception. And so as we move into this 2021 school year, and we've asked our school boards to approve these plans and plans that are created in consultation with teachers, with students, with families, with communities for the health and safety plan, with the local public health. It is important that that planning do, uh, does occur. 
I believe it was uh, George Kuros this morning that said, when you involve people on the front end, they own it and there's much less resistance and it's so much easier to implement. And I think the same thing goes true here. The state will be here to provide that collaboration, to provide that technical support and the resources. We have a whole host of resources already on the Department of Public Instruction's website. So we will be here to help our local school districts. They don't have to go it alone. We will be there. The example that we've set, I think at the state level, the legislators working with the governor's office, working with the Department of Public Instruction, with the Department of Health, that will flow through. It must flow down to our local school districts working with our local public health. And that is the model that North Dakota is setting and will continue to set. Really an approach that each school board, along with their administrators and the local uh, health officials, can figure out what's going to work in their community and make sure that they have the best plan laid forth. You, you both have talked a little bit about lifelong learning, and um, this morning Scott McNeely talked about what he envisioned for a flipped classroom looking like in 10 years. And so if we're going to be lifelong learners, and if we got anywhere close to his vision, taking what we learned from this spring at the state level, what do you think the greatest lesson we learned with distance learning is, or what types of improvements do you think we could see based on what we learned in, from this spring? So I will start this time. We'll kind of toggle back and forth if we can. Um, so one of the, the biggest lessons I think it's important to understand that, as, as has been mentioned many times, we modified and transformed the system in a matter of days. We turned our educational delivery model on a dime. And with that, a lot of grace was given, as it should be, as it should have been. A lot of grace was given to everyone. Grace was given to our schools. It was given to our teachers, to our administrators, to our students themselves, to the families. When we think about future disruptions and delivering school, delivering education for an entire school year in this model, we still need to provide grace to each other and understanding, realizing that none of us have ever, ever done this under a pandemic before. But the lessons learned is that the expectations still need to be high. Governor Burgum laid out at last week's press conference a dual mission that education is now delivering. A high quality education to all students, not just some, not just if you are blessed or you're capable, but to all students a high quality education system while keeping our students, our teachers, their families and our communities safe. So we've always tried to do that, we've always strove to do that, but it has taken on a whole new meaning in this, this pandemic world. And so as we move back into the fall, the governor's expectations for distance learning plan and the health and safety plan have been ratcheted up a bit. What does a grade look like? When you, we, um, Sal Khan talked about competency, mastery-based, proficiency-based, whatever term you wanna use. While we may not be able to measure attendance in the same way that we did before, we must measure progress of student learning so we can ensure that our students are receiving that promise that they deserve of a high quality education. Uh, I'll maybe take this in a little different direction, sort of broadly, what does the future hold? And I think COVID is just an accelerant that helps us get there. It helps us realize that uh, the methodologies, the traditions, the approaches that we've been taking, that maybe there's, there are new pathways. You don't have to give up everything we're doing, but there's some new opportunities. And when I think about scale in North Dakota, and I think about technology, uh, the scale we have is we're just, we're, we're, we're too small to have every, every school district replicate everything. And we're in same, we're, same with higher ed. I mean, we're, we're two, 11 universities we can't, that might have uh, 75 or 125 people teaching freshman English. We can't have 125 people, you know, each trying to create a great freshman English class and then wanting to have state dollars help pay for the, the software and the R&D and the curriculum to do that. And when I take a look at other parts of the country that are gonna struggle, I mean, we're, you know, with, you know, LA County has got 700,000 students just in LA County. Clark County, where the first lady and I visited a all, uh, you know, the first, you know, sober recovery high school in the country, public high school, 300,000 kids. We have 120,000. Uh, here in North Dakota across, you know, all schools, throw in BIE, take our privates, take homeschooling. Uh, we have an opportunity to collaborate in ways we haven't before. And then I take that, when this, you know, our small nimble scale, we're all working together. And then my daughter who was a, went to public school in Fargo and 
she had, she had a number of incredible teachers. Mr. Johansson uh, was te you know, teaching AP European history. It was amazing. And she was like, best teacher I've ever had. He's amazing. He's fantastic. This is incredible. Then he's got a class that's offered the next semester. And guess what? They don't have enough kids that sign up for it. So the class gets canceled. So we have silos not even across districts. That was silos across buildings because they couldn't get the schedules to match up and say between North and South and Davies, you know, we couldn't find the requisite 16 kids that want to take an AP class from one of the best teachers, uh, I shouldn't say best, but engaging teachers that they have. And so, but I think about a Mr. Johansson and it's like, if we're going to create the content, you throw in tools like we saw from Curriki Studio, do that. That kind of course, why would not be available to every student in the state? Because I, I know at Arthur, we didn't, have, we didn't have AP courses, period, much less AP European history. So I mean, so you could take somebody who's fantastic in our system and expose them the whole way, just like Saul Khan went from you know, his, his cousin to 100 million people. We, the tools are there. We can do the same thing. It's not just limited. It's not like Saul's got a patent on it and he's the only guy that can reach one to many. The technology platforms allow our best instructors to go one to many on content. So then what do the rest of the teachers do? Well, the rest of the teachers, as McNeely said, they can use, they can build relationships. They can say, what can I learn? you know, from my students? What can I learn to serve my students better? I mean, this idea that we're all learners, it frees up from what you've traditionally done, which is scary, because uh, you got to go do something new. But I, I think that the future holds, if the future held breaking down silos between departments and districts and universities, and I mean, across all of our education, uh, it could be, could be miraculous because then we could give the best of what we have to every student in North Dakota. And it wouldn't matter, you know, what zip code you're in. It wouldn't matter what school district you're in. It wouldn't matter, you know, the income levels of your school. It wouldn't matter what teachers are getting paid. We can give the best to everybody and we can do it in a very a super equity way uh, because we've got the technology and the tools and we've got teachers to do it. So that, that's what's exciting to me is something truly transformational. COVID is just a road bump where it gets in the way where we sort of realize it's not all about buildings. It's not all about, you know, competing between different di districts. It's about collaboration. So if I may be a little provocative as, as we do that, as, as COVID as the accelerant, um, so we have so many opportunities that COVID has provided us. I talked about it a bit um, before Sal came on about this is challenge creates opportunity and we have some opportunity here. Last session, North Dakota, our legislators led us, and we were bold, and we did away with the minimum requirement of days, and we transitioned that into hours. And that was the right direction, and I think all of us felt like we were going to, that was a, a, a good first step in the right direction. And then suddenly, one short year later, we're already thinking, is hours, are hours really the way to measure this? And is it really, right now we're measuring payment, and as I talked about in my presentation, we must begin to think as policymakers about rewarding learning that occurs outside of the school building walls and outside of the 8 to 3.30 day. So if we're gonna be real about that, there are some opportunities for solutions that I think we can find together. Because even though we have switched to measuring hours for our funding formula for our traditional school model, is it realistic to expect that we're measuring that learning on six and a half hours a day or six hours? I would say no. And I do know that several leaders in the state have already visited with me about ideas that they are contemplating about how to better measure attendance, if you will, or authentically measure engagement or that competency-based measurement. And so it, you know, to marry the two loves that I have of policy and education, that's where I think we have this great opportunity as a state to become involved with our, our legislators to, to determine how will we reward that learning that occurs in all place at all pace. So the, absolutely, if you can't hear that online, roarous, just uproarious applause. And I, I think that what I'm hearing is COVID is giving us the opportunity to make learning the fixed uh, in the constant that we can work towards and time can become a variable. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. Governor, you talked a little bit about collaboration just now, but throughout the day. And as we think about the collaborative efforts that, that we have in the state, Sal Khan said he's never worked with a state or even a country that has some of the infrastructure and frameworks that we have here in the state. 
What role do you think the state can play, whether it's your uh, branches or the legislature, uh, the Department of Health, Human Services? What do, you, what do you feel the state, what role can they play in moving into this next school year with the disruption that has been placed on us? Well, I, I think the first thing that we can do is continue to, uh, to uh, delegate and hold people accountable. That's what leaders do. We're saying, hey, it's up to school districts. Uh, we've given clear, clear guidelines. Here's a health and safety plan. Here's a distance learning plan. Got to get these approved by your local school board. So we're giving super clear guidance with plenty of lead time. Uh, we've got high expectations, which is what great teachers do. Uh, we've got high expectations that all the districts and all the buildings are going to be able to deliver great education regardless of what hits them this fall. And, and I think those, and again, I know that you're, you're, there's all kinds of anecdotes. All you got to do is go online. Oh, this, you know, distance learning was awful. It was this, it was that, it was that. I mean, there's that. There was also another thing that's probably not posted, which is some people had great experiences. So what can we do as adults to learn from those, the best ones and move forward? How do we take the, we've got massive amounts of cumulative distance learning experience from the spring that we never had before. You know, we would have done a pilot and it would have been like one class in one school. And I mean, and in 20 years, we wouldn't have as many literally teaching days as we have when we take all 120,000, you all go, everyone's got to go distance for two months. I mean, so massive amounts of learning. How do we take that as adults and say, how do we take that learning and make this fall even better? How do we incrementally, and how do we demonstrate to the kids that we believe in continuous improvement and continuous learning? We're asking them to learn more every year. Shouldn't we ask that of ourselves when we're doing this? So, so I'd say, again, the state's got to you know, gotta be a role model for what we're doing, which is data-driven. We're not ideological. There's a lot of ideology that flows into education. We're like trying to get the ideology out of the room, get the data into the room. Let's figure out what the data is on how kids learn. Let's get the data on, on how this disease moves, and let's just figure out the smartest possible things we can do to keep it going. And then when I, and the other thing was I think we have a we have a bully pulpit if you will to sort of just help remind people how much we have to let go of the past because when you think about the uh, the emphasis on buildings you know that we've put over the years and buildings are a tool but they're not they're not the, they're not the end all be all they're not the answer and guess what in North Dakota we've built a lot of buildings in the last 10 years where there's one secure entrance that everybody goes through. When they talk about COVID or reopening a stadium, they're like, no, have multiple entrances, have one be in, one be out. You know, don't have everybody touching the same doorknob every day. I mean, so some of the things that we've done, say for physical security play against us when we're trying to provide biological security, that goes against us. Then you say, okay, you know, in, in most of these new school buildings, can you open a window? No because they're all closed, you know, they're closed systems and we've got all this fancy HVAC. And then we see the explosion of, of cases in the southern part of the US. When did those start? It started when it got so hot that everybody turned their air conditioning on. Just like in New York, everybody was inside, now everybody in the, the Sun Belt states are inside. So I, I think that it, we have to, we've said, take it outside, but how would a school district that's got a building uh, that you can't even open a window. How do you think about reprogramming even when the kids come back in the fall and we've got a couple of months to learn how to do this? How do you move more stuff outside? So we, we have to literally try to take everything that we've taken for granted and just say, okay, let's start over, blank sheet of paper, what would make sense given the current situation we're in where I can still, where I can still teach? And if it's not perfect, it, if it's, you know, we're looking for progress, not perfection, so we can keep moving the whole thing forward. And if we've got progress versus per perfection, and we're, and we're up against other states that aren't even moving at all, we're going to be light years ahead of everybody. So I, I would say um, we all know that COVID is this ever-changing animal, and we're learning more and more about it every day. And so as that new information is presented, as new resources are created, as new best protocols are, are developed and shared, we look at uh, the Department of Public Instruction, the team that I work with, is the customer service entity to the many, many people that are engaged in K-12 education. So it's really a major responsibility of ours to ensure that we are empowering our communities, our families, our students, the teachers, everyone involved in K-12 education with the information and the resources and the support that they need. And we have 120,000 students K-12. We have another 20,000 uh, adults that get their paycheck or directly connected to a K-12 uh, school environment. So that's 140,000 people that have a direct impact, day-to-day -day impact. If you think that each of those 
people have at least one person in their life that is impacted by whether or not they go to school or if they stay healthy, that's nearly half of our state's population. And so it's, it's a great responsibility of ours that we communicate. So we'll be spending a lot of time providing resources, empowering people that are making those decisions, but also communicating to all of those that are impacted so there isn't so much fear, that they feel empowered with knowledge at the very least. And so we'll be spending a lot of time communicating. But we will also be uh, the other side, the other side of that coin for the Department of Public Instruction is we are a regulatory agency. And so the, the expectation of our state's taxpayers is that they are receiving a service that they are paying for in their taxes every year and the services that they provide. And so the governor's executive order did delegate um, that the Department of Public Instruction would do a random sampling and a review of distance learning plans and the safe and healthy plans. And so we will be doing that. But what I'm most excited about in that context of the customer service is, is going out and doing these audits or these reviews and sharing the exemplars and sharing the best practices of the things that we're seeing with the other school districts so we can all continue to, to grow and have that continuous improvement and we will all have those exemplars. And I certainly believe that there will be a lot of exemplars in our schools this coming year. As we heard today, we've got experts in our classrooms, in our district offices, so I'm excited for that. We have just a moment left. Uh, we have a lot of people who are excited to come back to school, a lot of people who are scared. If you could offer one word, phrase, or quote, something uh, to let all these people know we're heading into a great year to come, it, could you just share one word, phrase, or quote that we can look forward to this next year? I can, but I want to expand. <laughs> um, lean in, and I lean in, be engaged. The governor has provided some fabulous guidance as the expectation of the state. A component of that guidance is that our communities are involved in these decisions. I field questions often, and I can't answer those questions, and people leave frustrated and say, well, I guess they're all local control. We'll just have to wait and see what our district decides. And I always say, no, please don't. Lean in and help them decide. Lean in. Governor? I'd say uh, curiosity and humility. We've talked about it all day. We just have to not let ourselves make assumptions, curiosity. We have to keep asking questions, keep asking questions, and we have to understand that we may be humbled by this because things will come up that we didn't expect, but that's what happens when you're going in uncharted territory. But remember, uh, students are looking at us, and they're looking at us to, to be uh, mature problem solvers and figure out a way to safely and smartly move forward. This is, a, I think, a great opportunity for, for, for K-12 statewide to raise themselves up as institutions in their their communities even higher than they are because they can demonstrate that they can learn, you know, how to do things under really difficult conditions. I mean, the healthcare systems had to do that since March 1st. Uh, now we've got an opportunity, uh, you know, for K-12 to do it in the fall. And I, I think uh, there, there's going to be some real heroes that are going to come out of this. Thank you, Governor Burgum, Superintendent Baszler, for your leadership and certainly for the opportunity for school boards to lean in and find the problems so that they can solve the problems. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Luke. <laughs>